Welcome to Series 23 and to our first episode of 2020. Mm. We're really excited about this series and about what the new year will bring. Mm -hmm. We have scheduled our next few recordings for the year, and we can't wait for you to hear what we are working on. Uh, But we would love to hear from you as well. We recently put out a call on Twitter, but we want to ask here as well, is there any actual play podcast that you listen to that utilizes a unique system that you want us to feature on the show, let us know about it. Uh, We are always looking for awesome new and old games to discuss. Similarly, we'd love to hear about any concepts you want us to feature in our Evolution Cast episodes. Is there something you want to know more about? A concept you're struggling with as a player? Something that you as a GM wish your players knew? Let us know and we'll see about doing an episode on it. Mm -hmm. And finally, one of our favorite things to hear from you is reviews. Woo! Yeah! (laughs) Those are fireworks, in case Mm -hmm. you didn't. I was doing fireworks with my hands, but people can't see that, so. That's that's some very good Foley work over there. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, uh, probably the most helpful one. Uh, Stitcher, Podchaser, or anywhere else you shout into the void about shows that you like, uh, such as a review from Blake Ryan 74 from Australia on iTunes, titled Like a Warm Blanket. These folks make every guest feel welcome and have a good chat about the what's and why's of their role playing games. Well, worth a listen. Short and sweet. Thank yes. you so much, Blake Ryan. Thank you so much. I like that. I like being Mm -hmm. a warm blanket. I could go for a warm blanket right now. I'm really cold, actually. I know. A warm blanket would be so cozy right now. Yeah. Well, I guess if you want to be cozy, continue listening to the episode because it's like a warm blanket. Yeah. Enjoy. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia, and this episode, my co-host Ryan and I are thrilled to welcome Miguel and Tom, creators of Lancer, an RPG about mechs and their pilots. Welcome to Character Creation Cast. Uh, we are really excited you could join us. Really excited to be here. Yeah, <laughs> Thanks for having us on. Let's go ahead and start by introducing both of you to our audience. Um, Miguel, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and any projects you're currently involved in? Yeah, sure. Uh, So my name is Miguel. I'm a a writer uh, based out of uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, Tom and I have been uh, longtime uh, collaborators, friends. We've known each other forever. So like um, 17 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, which I'm sure we'll get to down the line and oh, yeah. talking a bit more about Lancer, but, um, I'm currently working on Lancer full time, actually. Uh, prior to that, I was working a number of, uh, different, um, different jobs, just food service, uh, working actually in radio production, which, uh, uh, uh hopefully explains, um, mm-hmm. How good I'll be on today's podcast. Yeah, you have a beautiful yeah. radio um, voice. <laughs> as you can tell by my great my great um control right mm-hmm, now. Mm-hmm. My old producers are probably <laughs> banging on the engineering booth right now. Uh, no, so I'm, I'm a writer. Lance is my only project. And uh, uh, it is both on the creative side and on the business side. It is all that I'm working on right now. Very nice. Cool. Yeah. And what about you, Tom? Uh, I'm... Um... Yeah, my name is sorry. My name is Tom Parkinson Morgan. Uh, <laughs> I uh, <clears throat> Lancer started as the work that I did to escape my other work, which was um, drawing comic books. So I, you might know me as the uh, writer and artist of the comic "Kill Six Billion Demons," which you can find on the web and published with Image Comics. Um, and uh, I've been doing that for about six years now. Formerly, I was a teacher in Japan for a bit, and. Um, yeah, and then halfway through, I decided to write a role-playing game for some reason. I'm not sure why I did that, but uh, there you are. 
That's how it usually starts, though. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you have an idea, and then it won't go away, and you're like, Fine. now I have to make this. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> <sighs> what a burden. Yeah, it's definitely one of those... Definitely one of those projects that started to steamroll after we realized what we kind of had. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, it, yeah, it was a hobby that became a, a bit more of a hobby and then it became work. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I'm really excited to talk about this game. I've heard nothing but good things and I haven't had the chance to play it yet. So this is as close as I've come so far and I'm so excited. About it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I, I, me too. I'm excited to delve into it. I love talking about RPG stuff, so... Cut me off if I'm talking too much. So I'll just rant for <laughs> Not a thing. We can do that. We can fix it in post. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go ahead and get into it. Um, mm-hmm. And we are going to start by discussing what this game is all about. Mm. Sure. What's in a game? Wow. Since this is a new game, yes. can you give us a quick like elevator pitch for the game, the genre, the setting, that kind of thing? You know, Miguel, Miguel um, does a pretty good job of this, but I'll say he invented, he invented the term... <laughs> Mud and lasers, which I, I should quite like, because it sounds like something that already existed, but it really didn't. I think he actually made that up. But um, I hope I did. Otherwise, credit did to whoever did, but I, I, know. I, I think I did. Yeah, I think I you know. did. Yeah, so I'm going to say I did until someone in the comments tells me that I did. We, we like to say <laughs> we like to say Lance is a is a mud and lasers mech game, and it's mm. about it's an RPG about customizing and and making a, a terrifying war machine, and the implications therein. Um, and it combines um, very narrativist uh, out of combat stuff and then tactical combat, which is uh, its main focus, I'd say. Um, mm. And uh, and it has a heavy emphasis on on customization and like building your the mech and making the mech the mech you want to pilot and you know like your relationship with your mech and stuff. And that's mm. kind of how it, that's sort of what the game is about. Is that right, Miguel? Is that how you pitch to somebody? Yeah, essentially, it's a it's a I'd say it's a. a rules light on the narrative side uh, and, and rules heavy on the tactical side. And uh, I think our intent um, followed the germ of the idea, which was a, uh, you know, it began, I think there's a lot of uh, having had to do a lot of time catching up in the mech genre. Cause I was not very familiar with it at all. Yeah, until, no, very, really. Uh, probably a year or so after we started fighting Lancer. Um, I feel like it starts where some uh, uh, mecha genre starts uh, in that the, we wanted to do something uh, that was cool. And then the more we spent um, writing the, the sort of mechanical systems of it, and, and certainly speaking for myself on the narrative side, mm. we realized that we had something that was, um, we could say a lot with it. Yeah. Uh, or at least, yeah. at least set up a, a system and, and a setting that, that players at their tables could, could start to unpack a lot. We, we, we both like science fiction a lot, um, me and Miguel, in, in the sense of that, like, hard sci-fi, like, speculative fiction, but we also quite like, um, we like, we like weird, we like weird um, space fantasy, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, we like Star Wars and all that stuff, so that, all, that kind of appealed to us um, mm. uh, a lot, and we, we vibe on a lot of the same things, I'd say, right, right, Lopez? Like, you and me, yeah. we have similar yeah, ideas so. about, so... So that's, uh, you know, that's kind of, we, we like that sense of like discovery and mystery. And um, I, I'd also like to say, uh, um, so so if, if you want to know the distinction, what we actually do, and I, I like, I'm, I'm actually, if you're listening, I'm actually pointing to the other window where Miguel is right now on my screen. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense because that's a visual bit and no one will get it. Um, but Miguel, Miguel's basically handled like, 90% of the writing for the game, like the, the fluff and the narrative and like all the other, the setting and all that stuff. And I've handled maybe 90% of the mechanical side of the game. And then we, we kind of touch base and we sort of have a conversation through the, but our respective mediums and then sort of build the game that way. So a lot of the way the game got built would be, I would write some something in the you know rules that was, was named something weird, like, like paracausal, light cannon and then miguel would be like oh what is that and he'd have to figure that out and put that in the story <laughs> and that's how sort of how the game got created so if, so from that perspective if you want if you want to think about that miguel did a lot of the setting stuff and but we both was sort of involved in in the creation of the game originally um but i think it was also very important to us to return to my original point that um Lance was fundamentally an optimistic sci-fi setting hmm. because both of us are quite tired of dystopias mm-hmm. and um 
and uh, we think we think we got enough of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we wanted to write something that was a little more upbeat. Well, I got not upbeat, but but hopeful. I, I don't guess. think it's, yeah. I think yeah. there's there's to say it's upbeat. Uh, uh, yeah, that's where I I, I I break with Tom on that one, but not not really. It sounds like I actually cut him off as we're starting to agree on this. <laughs> no, I don't mean um, I didn't. Yeah, yeah, I didn't mean yeah. upbeat. I mean I mean like h- hopeful, optimistic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, not not cynical about about not you know, cynical. Things. Yeah, yeah. and certainly the the elevator pitch part of it is that it's Lancer is rules light and tactics heavy mm-hmm. with deep customization mm-hmm. and and. Uh, uh, Sort of character prompting and story prompting lore built into the mechanics. Of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we were, it's very important to us too that we put a lot of flavor um, in the game mechanics themselves uh, and and the character part, which you'll see if you read through the game. Um, we like to I like to joke with people that Lance is the only RPG that puts uh, lore in the item descriptions, which is a Dark Souls joke, um, <laughs> but it does it does do that. So um, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. So, uh, what sort of things do we need to play this game then? D twenty and a D six, and uh, you know you can get a character sheet or a sheet of paper or our cool free app ComCon, and you can build a character in it. And the book, obviously, uh, and the rules, the rules, yeah, yeah, yeah. The game is as game designers, you should like mention there's a game involved with mm-hmm. this. <laughs> there is, there is there a is. product that you can buy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can. Or you can get for free, actually. Uh, oh, yeah, have, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have. So one of the things that was very important for us is uh, the um, being able to offer this. So we knew early on in the production process of Lancer when it actually became a production process and not something that was just a hobby for us to work on, that uh, we would be releasing it digitally. And if it was going to be released digitally, that means we'd control it basically in, up until the point that we actually published it online. Um, so we figured both in the interest of... Um, making the game accessible to folks regardless of a price point um, and, and ensuring uh, that basically everyone would be able to play it uh, and play the official version that we'd always have a free version. Out there. I, so I am if, a strong believer in putting things on the internet for free, um, which is kind of a weird, I don't know, I, I could talk about it at length, but I, I, I think that um, the nature of the internet is one of its huge strengths is the ability to like people to participate in, in things and to, form communities around games mm-hmm. or media or what have you. And uh, so I thought it'd be really important to us to have an open development process. So we always had the game for free, available for free online. Um, and even today, the core rules of the game were still free, uh, completely oh, free. Nice. And the only thing that you have to pay for in the, in the, the full game is the um, NPC creation rules and the setting stuff. So if you're thinking about it this way, if you have a game of like five five people in your group, only one person needs to buy the game, uh, <laughs> and it and it's a twenty five dollar PDF. Is that right, Mix? Yeah, yeah twenty five bucks. bucks. So so think about it that way. Yeah, Chip in five bucks. You know, mm-hmm. each person you get a you get a copy of the game. You'd be good to go. Yeah, and this is a this is a four hundred plus page PDF. So it is yes. A lot of, a lot of nice yeah, and it's beautiful. Like the art. Thank you. Okay, the art. Oh my god. Thank yeah, you very much. So I did most so of it, so uh, you know I have to take that personally. <laughs> it's, so, you know, it's so good. Tom is the more it's humble so of the two of us. <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah. Love it. Mm-hmm. So, part of having that open development process is how you ended up with CompCon, correct? Yeah, yeah. Well, so yeah. basically, we had this incredible community that sort of appeared because Lopez and I put it on the web on in, in Google Drive, actually, just for a long time. It was just a link you could get, grab it from. <laughs> oh man, those early days. Yeah, and um, and uh, unformatted. So pe- yeah, unformatted. Yeah, just like really just raw just text. Unformatted PDF. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And uh, pe- people were grabbing it and playing it. Eventually, we, we found quite by accident, like about a year in the development process or, or, or less than that even, that people were playing the game to a high degree. And there was a quite large Discord community that was playing it. And so we discovered lots of people through that and did lots of playtesting and got lots of feedback. And um, yeah, one of the people on there was making a free app uh, for, for use with a game called CompCon. And so we ended up bringing them on and officially funding it, which is probably one of the best decisions we've made, I, I think, right? Easily. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, free, it's freely available and it's an excellent character builder app and it does make character building uh, much easier than just doing it by hand, even though by hand it's not too too complicated. But I wrote the game, so maybe it's easier for me. <laughs> <laughs> You've looked at it for a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What kind of themes and stories did you want to explore with this game? I know you've mentioned a little bit that you wanted to kind of be hopeful more than dystopian. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, 
were there other themes and like ideas that you you wanted this game to really embody? I'll I'll answer briefly, but then Miguel will answer like because he this is sure. more his jam. But um, we we went through when we very f- wrote, first wrote the game. We just had this crazy idea to write games together that we think we wanted to think about like several core concepts to the game, which was yeah, it was like um, it was optimistic uh, that we didn't want a setting that was going to be like um, sci-fi where there's a bunch of like rubber forehead aliens in it. Like it's just people. Um, mm-hmm. We don't like the way that other RPGs handle uh, race. Mm-hmm. And stuff because it, it it it's very there's a lot to talk but you know you know yes. uh, 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 and and so we didn't like that we didn't like that at all um you know it just ends up being different varieties of people you know with various rubber forehead makeup and stuff so I think we agreed there would be no aliens in the setting mm. m- mostly right right Lopez like that was that was one yeah of our we can talk about that later but yeah um <laughs> like like we decided that we wanted to answer questions about like people's relationship with technology. And warfare, and um, it was also important to us that the central power in the setting was not like some kind of evil empire, and was actually like trying to do the right thing. And mm. that fundamentally, that there was a, uh, an element of like of like um, positivity about that. I think was was very important early on. And those are the questions that I was interested in as, as like a, a fan of sci-fi. But mostly, I just wrote cool, cool names for stuff and let Miguel figure a lot of it out. But, uh, <laughs> but it was kind of a conversation as we went because I would write stuff and then he would write stuff based on that stuff, and then I'd go back and adjust what I was working on based on the themes that he was pulling out. But he was the guy who led the lead, so I'll, I'll let him answer a bit more of the. That's my sort of short short list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. So, uh, I mean, to echo sort of a lot of what Tom said, we we, you know, Lancer is an interesting thing for me to work on. And it's often a challenging thing for me to work on. I'm a, I'm a writer who's used to writing in um, like short stories or novel length uh, work. Um, prior to Lancer, I was in an MFA. So my only real, I guess you could call it writing experience um, was writing, you know, things that I had total control over uh, stories that I, well, as much as you can have total control over a story, I had total control over it. Um, so when we uh, when we sat down to work on Lancer, it began as something that we thought was cool. And the more we discussed, I guess, the why behind, you know, why we thought certain aspects of it were cool, we decided, or I certainly decided as, as someone who was going to be doing the bulk of the writing in the setting, that we needed to have uh, a setting that was aware of the fact that uh, uh, basically war and empire is not good, um, despite the fact that we are asking our players to engage um, you know, in violence uh, generally in, in relation to or opposition to uh, um, either you know, in a setting like extant or extinct imperial aims. Yeah, we, um, we, we wanted people to get in like cool robots and then, like, yeah. think about why they're in a cool robot, and like, and like, yeah, you know, because <laughs> Lancer is, 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 I think, like, despite the sort of the very the sort of flash uh, appearance, the flashy appearance of of you know the, the art and the machines and the um, sort of hard science fiction aesthetic with soft science fiction science and and um, the sort of appeal and mystery and excitement of it all uh, at its core and in, in the sense sort of sounds cliche it sounds like anything a novelist would say or a writer would say uh, <laughs> yeah you're such or, a writer whether they're writing <laughs> games or stories or whatever not to distinguish between the two but i guess the distinguish between the medium um you know lancer is fundamentally a a story about people and yeah. and and or is a setting that is is concerned about people and and sort of the um systems of power that they operate in and and uh uh and and the ones that they uh, operate in opposition to. Um, I think there's there's a uh, it's it's hard for me to say what Lancer is about because it feels to me like there's so much room to tell stories in it. Yeah, big grand stories. Yeah, to, um, to ones that are are are, are much smaller. We made uh, sure that it was it was open for people to kind of do their own thing in, but we wanted to make sure that the tone of the setting you know, set the expectations right. for the kind of game it was going to be. And that was yeah, very important a, to us. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a baseline tone um, to the setting that I hope sort of defines yeah. through, uh, through people reading um, <laughs> the optional behind the paywall. <laughs> setting <laughs> section. Well, we have a lot, we have a lot of it in the flavor text. We, the, we do. So the we character do. options too though. Yeah. I guess it's, it's my hope that, that in reading the setting, people can find out what I guess 
Tom and I want Lancer to be about, which mm-hmm. is 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 about a, a fundamentally, um, if there's a distinction to, to be made between hopeful and optimistic, a, a, a fundamentally hopeful setting where uh, uh, the um, uh, the the only bad guys are 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 undeniably human, and the mm-hmm. only good guys so far uh, uh, are 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 also undeniably human. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't. We didn't. Um, so, we, despite the fact yeah. that it's a game about giant robots and how you build them and how you pilot them, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I think I, I would hope that that we've written something that is is still concerned about the people inside the machine, mm-hmm. both mm-hmm. literally and and um, uh, thematically. I guess. I, I think thematically, I think that's what we're kind of going for. I think it's important because a lot of RPG um, games out there today, to me, I think to both of us, like have a lot of un- unexamined assumptions about, you know, colonialism yeah. and, 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 mm-hmm. and um, you know, race and all the kinds of weird mm-hmm. stuff that are kind of rooted in some interesting, yeah. You know, <laughs> we power wanted... and economics and, 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 and everything. Basically. Yeah, and yeah. We, ca- we kind of wanted to avoid that and make something that, that was implicitly trying to ask you to be a little bit self-reflective about getting in your giant war machine. Um, but also have a good time while doing it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to, to not only to not only place people in the context of something where there's like these massive powers that are are you know on the one hand unassailable um, and 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 all over the place and that you're implicated in in supporting by using their equipment in the in the game, right? Uh, to to not only have 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 that in there, but have you like <laughs> be able to fight back and mm-hmm. uh, uh, and and have that be be meaningful. Even if ultimately the scale that an individual, no matter how powerful they are, can affect, is is still relatively small. The game also asks you to think a lot about your goals. I think um, in in yeah. the structure of the game, and so it's it's always asking like, what do you want to do with this like giant godlike walking death armory that you've constructed? So, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I think I think I think it does a pretty decent job of that. I, I've I've actually I've Hopefully, written a lot of yeah. games. And what I always found was that I tried to make settingless games, but I actually found that never worked because setting to me is very important because it sets a degree of tone and expectation for the game. Mm-hmm. Um, even if it doesn't have any mechanical implications, the, the setting itself will say, yeah, this is a game about whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's important. Yeah, it gives you like that box to work within, which mm-hmm. I know for a lot of people, me included, is, a, is important because it's hard when you have like this wide open thing right. to just figure out yeah. where to even start. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I never got into um, games like um, Fate because it's just too like mm-hmm. unspecified for me. Mm-hmm. It doesn't doesn't yeah. give me anything to work with, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, so uh, what do characters specifically do then in this game? Uh, the game, the game mechanically is about uh, building building a giant robot and then running missions with a giant robot. And that's it. That's that's what the game is about. It's very focused. Okay. Um, and it has it has a defined play structure, which is you uh, go on a mission. You have a goal in that mission. You may or may not accomplish it. You get more resources after the mission, and you go into downtime. And then you figure out what your character does during the downtime. And then you're on to the next mission. So interesting. Um, it's it's it tells you directly like this is the way the game plays. Yeah. I'm getting there's, like. There's... Uh... Like Sorry. a mech warrior combined with night witches vibe. Oh sure, yeah. the The most direct inspiration for it was Blades in the Dark, actually. Ooh. Um, because I love how the game cycle in that game is like you're going to go on a heist and then you're going to go to, into downtime. Yep. And that's going to lead back into a heist, and we know that, and so we can build a narrative around that. And I think. That oh, that's was, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, there's a narrative cycle in this. Mm-hmm. There is very much, and that's the game. That's what the game's about. Huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as a system, it's 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 fun because I think there's right now is a great time for indie RPGs and mm-hmm. especially for RPGs that do a ton of different things and not necessarily only combat. So I think it's it's while we do have narrative side and we do have a downtime actions, Lancer is definitely like do a lot of fighting in it. And yeah, it's kind of it's stuff. yeah, it's kind of it's very much focused. I mean, the uh, the majority of the rules and stuff are about tactical combat. So you know, I can't lie to you and sell you the game is about examining your feelings. It's about destroying things with your giant robot. Mm-hmm. Not that that's a bad thing. There's a, right. I can't swear on this podcast. So no. I can't say the entire <laughs> quote. Um, but there was a, a, a poet who told me that um, you'll feel a whole lot better uh, if you can shoot off the, and then, and then bleep a lot of this out, but the oppressor's head, basically. 
Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, I'm thinking about like, uh, our game is very combat focused, but I don't think necessarily that that is um, uh, uh, a bad thing, Mm-mm. hopefully, in the setting. <laughs> hopefully players are... <laughs> you're, you're such a writer. No, um, yeah, we, recently, writer we recently re-released an episode, but we covered um, the concept of the eight kinds of fun. Mm-hmm. And one of those kinds of fun is challenge, which mm-hmm. is basically like you like to go into a thing and you like to beat something. Sure, yeah. You yeah. want to go yeah. up against a monster or a boss or something like that, and you want you want to win. Mm-hmm. And there's this feeling sometimes, I think especially in the indie space, that like RPGs are not for winning, um, mm-hmm. which, I, you know, I agree hmm. with. But there's also the idea that like within that, you can – beat something and you can beat the odds or you know like have your combat experiences and for a lot of people that is a thing that is really satisfying to them like that is their preferred type of fun is i go up against this thing and i beat the challenge yeah uh, and 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 you know violence and in the you know giant mech fights are a very good source of drama so i think that's Mm -hmm. what we what we enjoy but i also like there's an aspect to which i enjoy which is like the the sense of like ownership you have over this like giant war machine you 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 inhabit because you've built it yourself and stuff and you know in in a sense like mech mech anime and mech like media is always about like being really empowered you know and like Mm -hmm. learning how to how to how to use those powers and i think that's that's also an aspect of it which is quite fun oh yeah Mm mm-hmm what is something that you feel is particularly unique about this game that sets it apart from other games about mechs even or just games in general? Um, I, I think we've paid a lot of attention to feel and flavor in Lotsu. And it was very important to me and Lopez from the very beginning that, that again, we talked earlier about tone, like the tone was communicated very clearly, but also that um, when you picked character options and when you do stuff in Lotsu, it feels very satisfying. Uh, both in terms of like actually playing the game, but in terms of like even just picking gear for your character or making character builds. Like I, I mentioned before, we have flavor text in almost every character option. Um, so even as, it's not just like you're picking a, a choice from a list, like you're you're actually reading about the mech that you're about to take parts from as you're building your character. So we wanted to really immerse people in that, and I think that's something that our game does does very well compared to other games. Um, and also, I think we have a, a very well-tested game, and it's very balanced. And um, the sense of uh, the, the combat and everything is like very tactical, but it's pretty fast-paced. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of a lot of games get very bogged down in like minute detail when it comes to that stuff. And I think we've done a fairly good job of refining that over time. So it's a nice experience where you feel like you'll have a lot of options, and it's very satisfying to play. Because I love a lot of the tactics games. I really love XCOM. You guys played XCOM at all? Oh, XCOM is one of my favorites. <laughs> XCOM is like one of my favorite games ever. Miguel knows. Yeah. I used to I used to play like Iron Man Impossible oh, yeah. runs of that and just like c- curse out every five minutes because <laughs> my favorite guy got you know. I used to like I used uh-huh. to save scum sometimes. Yep, that, yeah, that was, yeah. That was, uh, that was my strategy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I love I love that stuff. I love I like you know like Fire Emblem and all those little, like tactics mm-hmm. stuff. I love I love games like that. So that was a direct inspiration. But I think not enough games in the RPG space, aside from you know games that are D and D four E derived or inspired, really pay attention to that tactic side of the game. Um, and try to refine it into something that is, is like balanced, playable, and like and like very refined, you know. Yeah. Like like if you're gonna have a game in a game, make it a game. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And that sounds a little redundant, but there are certain games out there <coughs> I won't <coughs> mention D and D five e that that have a tactical combat component to them, but don't really examine why that's the case, and don't make any effort to make it particularly interesting. Yeah. So uh, we've tried to try to do a good job of that. I, ho- I hope I hope we have. People have certainly given us good feedback about it. So yeah, yeah. I think one of the things that's been really interesting is that people are often confused about Lancer because they come into it thinking that uh, the the um, I would say uh, I'd, I'd hope that the setting is something that is is unique about Lancer uh, and and the setting as seen yeah, I'd through sort of so. player facing options, mm. which I find funny because sometimes people. Uh, certainly on uh, like new folks to the fan discord, which we can shout out at the end of this uh, or on Twitter often get um, confused about the setting because they expect it to be far more grim. They do. Or far more cruel. Yeah. Uh, than, than I think either Tom or I have written it to be. Mm. Uh, they really so want it to be cynical. <laughs> they really do. So badly. Yeah. It's um, weird. 
And yeah, I don't know how to tell them other than to tell them plain. Like it's not, <laughs> if you're reading something cynical into the setting, it's, it's either, uh, I think it's, it's not a us problem. Um, so <laughs> I would say, I would say like having a, uh, yeah, at least a non-cynical setting is, is, is relatively unique when it comes to a game that is, uh, you know, in many respects about power struggle mm-hmm. war in, in sci-fi empire. too especially. in science fiction well, yeah. and especially something that has such a focus on combat too. oh yeah yeah. yeah 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 and like death is a thing in our game too mm-hmm. which is which is another thing that like as a writer you know thinking about how um you know form following function i guess the sort of the story mm-hmm. and the mechanics together the setting and the mechanics together um you know that's why i think i pause sometimes when i say i don't know if lancer is an optimistic game but it's a hopeful game yeah sure yeah um, mm-hmm. because you can still die yeah you, you can you can die in lancer it's fairly hard and we actually had a conversation about this because i i had a i wanted to include a mechanic in the game i was like i mean we need to, we need to have an option of people who want to be able to bring a character back that's that's died so i'm like so we have to bring cloning into this and Miguel's yeah. like, I don't want to include like like people coming back from the dead. I'm like, well, it doesn't have to be the original character. So Lancer has this take where like, if you if you die, if your character dies, they're dead. I mean, that person is dead, but mm-hmm. you could play a clone of them, um, <laughs> just just once. But it, but then we also talk about the impact that has in in the world and in the universe, and the fact that cloning exists, and it's like really sketchy, and like there's all yeah. kinds of you have to roll on the complications chart if if it happens and. Like all this other stuff is spun off from it, so you know we, um, it, it, yeah, we. I guess I guess we try to think about the implications of, of th- certain things existing or not existing in, in mm-hmm. the game universe as well. In Which is in and part why stuff. the book is, is like four hundred and fifty pages. Yeah, long. yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Partly, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Uh, so we, we talked a lot about the, the history game, uh, here and there throughout the conversation, but, uh, I wanted to dive a little bit further into that, a little bit more of the specifics. Um, so way back at the start, mm-hmm. where did this idea come from initially? Well, um, Lopez we playing, and I we were playing D and D. We were playing D and D, and then we, yeah. we we were driving. You're we like, this game's dumb. I'm gonna write it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what D and D needs more mechs. Well, well, we, yeah. we, I mean, it does. We, I actually met Miguel playing D and D third edition in middle school. In middle school. Oh. Um, and then we nice. played a bunch of fourth edition in, in college, and so like it's always kind of been a thing between us. Um, and we were driving to go get fitted for suits hmm. for a friend's wedding. <laughs> and in the car, he, Miguel's like, I want to play a mech game, but there aren't any mech games out there that aren't, like, proprietary games or, like, apocalypse world hacks. And I was like, well, well we could just write one. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. you know... No big deal. Later, we could just yeah. do that. Yeah, and at, at the time, I just finished writing an apocalypse world hack for my comic. I made an RPG for my comic um, that people were asking me about. They were like, I want to write a D&D hack for your comic. And I was like, I'm not going to do that, but I will do an apocalypse world one. So I did one of those. <laughs> and I actually published that on my Patreon and, uh, you know, got it laid out and everything. And I was like, oh, that was not too bad. That was pretty fun. So I ran it by Miguel. I was like, hey, let's just write a game. Let's do it. <laughs> um, and I, like an idiot, I decided to write it from scratch instead of oh like hacking in an a existing system. Oh, the and then, hubris! Uh, yeah, <laughs> two, years, two years later, there we are. But it was very fun because we lived yeah, together this, at the time. The the specific process too was was mm-hmm. Tom would write, I and mean, we've we've said it a couple times, but but just for to, to keep it concise in one section, <laughs> yeah. to help with post processing, uh, Tom would write. Uh, it would often work in this way where Tom would write uh, a set of rules mm-hmm. and, and a set of equipment and pass it to me with um, just the name, just the name or sometimes itself. just, or sometimes just the, the, the sort of function of what it's supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. And, and I would write, uh, uh, initially just fluff. So just sort of like, um, dialogue or, or brief description about it. Um, because I think both of us really thought that, uh, initially, uh, having never played Dark Souls, uh, but, but having <laughs> Tom have, Tom had, I played a Tom ton of it before Souls. and he, he sort of wanted that, that sort of sense of, being able to find again, it's my understanding that it works in this way. In, in the game, you can you can sort of find lore seeded throughout the world, and yeah. and if it, Lancer at that early stage of the world was just basically player options and rules, we would mm-hmm. we would stick the world in in those. Yeah. Um, yeah. So development basically continued like that for uh, 
for the whole, at least the whole first year of us working on this. Cause it was, it was also a, a side thing that we were working on. Yeah. It was very much a secondary project for, for both of us. Yeah, yeah. And, and sort of remains a secondary project for me in a weird way, but, um, <laughs> but it's uh, yeah, it was like a side thing we were doing. And then, and then basically as soon as we found that there was a huge community playing the game, cause we put it up for free, we began to collect a lot of playtesting feedback. And so we became more serious about making iterative versions of the game and, finishing out for it and Miguel actually began to write like an enormous amount of material for the for the game and for like yeah. like a lot of the stuff we we're gonna be publishing in the upcoming year Miguel actually wrote um like a year ago or more. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, I think the earliest versions are probably late twenty seventeen mm-hmm. for or, we had a number of stretch goals that we hit uh and during our Kickstarter that we'll uh, our goal is to publish them sort of quarterly as as, as this mm-hmm. year comes on. Mm-hmm. Um we'll see how those were all written yeah, yeah. ages ago. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, and then, then basically it came to the point where we were just like, well, do we want to try to finish this properly and publish it? And we decided, yeah, that'd probably be a good idea. I mean, there's enough interest in the game. There's a huge amount of buzz about it, and there was actually for a long time, um, despite the game not even being properly laid out or finished or anything, we had a ton of people playing it. So we decided to take it to Kickstarter um, back in May, and uh, that was a very harrowing process, but it went really well. So, <laughs> and uh, The run now, to it, at least. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that was the uh, that's the development process pretty much. Very open though, kept it very open. A huge amount of very participation cool. from people on the Discord. Um, people emailing yeah. us and sending us messages, being like, "This is broken. This is wrong. This is going." I'm like, "Okay, <laughs> no problem." But one thing one thing I do want to say about the development process though is is it was certainly something that uh, Tom and I had to make time for. Oh, yeah. um, mm-hmm. outside of our, our main things. Because at the time, I was working food service mm-hmm. and a, uh, a radio job. It was and I would, write, I would write Lancer when I should have been like doing side work yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. or, or paying, paying attention to my, to my, uh, to my levels. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Tom would find time outside of working on his, his comic as his main thing. So yeah, yeah. It, was a, it was a risk that we, uh, that we took to take it um, more seriously. Uh, and it was definitely a risk that was supported by um, a healthy community that actually invited us um, to join them at, at a server, a Discord server that they already set up and started running. I, I, I think to a degree, like the kind of thing that I like to do, um, which is to like be very public and let people consume stuff for, for free and then participate and then ask them later to support you. You can't really do that as a primary gig for a while. That's the one caveat I have to add mm-hmm. is that you have to be doing something else, right? Bef- you know, you yeah, can't, they can't make a living. job. You can't, yeah, don't quit your day job. Yeah. <laughs> It was fun I do though. Want to ask, like, how do you maintain that momentum? Because, like, that's a I, that's a thing that I've found really hard. Like, podcasting easy mm-hmm. enough because you have a release schedule, right? Like, you mm-hmm. you've, you've said it's going to come out every week, right? Um, but I know as I try and like dip my toes into game design, I'm finding that like making time for that or keeping up the momentum of it, especially when you're working with someone else too, and you have to have like find time to kind of collaborate on things, right. is really right. difficult. Well. Collaboration from Miguel and I was fairly easy because we actually lived together. So we, we would literally do things like go across the hall and like bang in the door and be like, "What do you What do you think about this?" Like, check out the, <laughs> um, but but like in terms of finding time, um, it might be different from Miguel because I I am a workaholic and uh, I have also been doing I've been working for myself like independently um, self employed comic artist for four years now. Um, mm-hmm. And so I'm used to doing. I'm used to doing that. I like. I, I am to a degree extremely self motivated, but that's very very difficult. Yeah. And it's very very. It's like a very hard lifestyle to like adjust to and like not have it be unhealthy. So I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> that's, that's essentially my. That's essentially my uh, my explanation. It's just like, and you know, the thing I'd say is that you, you need to make it a by making it a public process. We automatically had an audience that was. Uh, waiting for updates on, on mm. things, so it was a yeah, very. Yeah, say it sounds like that was like a good f- motivating factor too. Absolutely, to, like, people yeah, constantly yeah, checking in with you, mm-hmm. like, when's more stuff going to come out? When if, are you going to fix this? If you want to publish anything, you must do it to a degree that people will read and participate in your work. Mm. I There's no other way to do it. For myself, right now. <laughs> 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 yeah, you can't. You can't keep it to yourself. I, I know people who who do game development or comics, or whatever, yeah. and they never publish anything. Mm-hmm. Um, or put it out even for people to check out, and and uh, to me that you're not you're not actually doing producing that until you expose it to other people. In, mm-hmm. my, in my opinion, I don't know, Miguel. What do you think? What's your? Yeah, I mean, let's see. How did I keep up the motivation to work on Lancer? Um, when 
it wasn't my main full-time job, which I have to fully acknowledge is a combination of, of massive luck and, uh, and, and, and hard work. When it wasn't my full-time job, it was my escape. Mm-hmm. Um, I, so I, I've, uh, about the time we started working on Lancer was, uh, just in the, in the sort of, um, in the year after I'd finished up with my, uh, MFA. So I was very used to pulling long hours writing. Um, mm-hmm. I was working as waiting tables and, uh, and working at a radio station and, and sort of those two jobs, I would, I would work all morning from, um, it was a morning show that I was working on. Uh, so I'd work all morning from maybe five in the morning till about, uh, usually 11 to noon. Um, and then I'd run to my, uh, restaurant job and work from about, um, uh, four to 10 or 11, uh, not kind of, not kind of closing. Um, so Lancer was my escape. Lancer was the thing that I could write. Um, a lot of stuff got left on the cutting room floor because there'd be a lot of frustrations that I'd write into it. Um, but it was also my place to, 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 to continue on with the thing that I wanted to do, which was write uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, narrative fiction. Um, and, and if I could do it anywhere, uh, uh, Lancer seemed like a good bet because you know I was working on it with a friend of mine, um, Tom. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. You yeah. guys are friends? Uh, yeah. Quite, uh, wow. <laughs> that Tom guy, I don't know about No, I question that all the time. <laughs> Oof. No, so, so I uh, love you, buddy. Um, so, I, uh, uh, so it was basically, it was my escape. It was my refuge. It was a thing that I could work on to feel like a human being. Um, my, my radio job was, was great, and I cared deeply about it, but it was... Um, incredibly difficult and it was all uh it was it was for a news yeah, show they didn't never paid you um, enough for that man it was crazy yeah uh, oh my uh, so God. i was, was working working um uh for not a lot of money uh, you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even pay for that for a, yeah he was dumb. for a section of it yeah but, but oh boy um, <laughs> so so it was tough <laughs> Uh, that was tough. And then food service is, is food service. I mean, solidarity mm-hmm. with everyone out there punching the clock on that. I've worked that I've worked in various restaurants ever since um, all, all through college, basically, uh, and a little bit in high school, too. Um, and, and it was, uh, you know, it's hard to 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 interact with people um, uh, while you're doing work that people think is unskilled. Uh, and and uh, Lancer was a place that I could write out my frustrations with um capitalism with everything that I saw in the news every day with everything uh, uh, that made life hard for myself and for people that I loved. Uh, And it was also a way to write in that hope, you know, what does a better world look like? Um, What does an optimistic, and I know I said it's not optimistic, but hopeful, but what does an optimistic (laughs) future look like? Um, (laughs) Even one, you know, that, that is, that is undeniably, sort of couched in, in a lot of fears and anxieties that I think um, that I have about the present world. And then I think a lot of folks um, have about the present world. Um, Lancer in the early days. Um, it's a, a, it's a, it's a real it's millennial. It's a real millennial RPG, isn't it? It's pretty terrible. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, it's like, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in, in the early days, it was, it was very much like it was, it was, it was writing, um, writing at the mouth of a fire hose, you know, like it was actually very easy to write, although it was not healthy. I should have been sleeping, you know, mm-hmm. I should have been hydrating and going to the gym or going outside, but I would spend time writing Lancer instead. <laughs> um, and, and I think the fact that both of us didn't treat it as a project, but we treated it as, as, as a hobby and as, uh, you know, a, a, a a shared labor of love until mm. we, we we sort of realized over a course of a couple conversations uh, towards the end of um, 2018, I want to say that we actually had something that we um, had a following uh, and we had a little bit of time um, to to try and make it be more than a hobby. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't, I, you know, I don't know. I, I like, I hate to, to say that the process of, of, of writing Lancer was one that was um, just a, a process of perseverance and, and grinding at it. Cause as someone who I like, think there's something to be said for that though, because I think that that's a thing that I've started getting out of the projects that the couple of projects that I've been working on is this like, so, like, obviously, if you have an MFA, like, you're very passionate about writing in those kinds of pro- – like, you don't do that kind of thing unless you are really super into it. Yeah. Um, and I think, 
like some of what I've found that I'm getting out of mine is like I have a degree in political science. Yeah. My job is like uses some of those skills, but it doesn't deal with like the politics part of it. But like Mm -hmm. I started doing like world building projects and I've pulled out like all of my political science books to be like, Mm -hmm. okay, here's what the government structure looks like and how these things interact. And it's like, these are things that I'm really passionate about, but I don't get to deal with in my regular life. And so Mm -hmm. part of that hobby too is just like, oh, right. These are things that I really love and want to participate in. Here's here's the problem. Here's the problem is that uh, I think everyone that comes to a project like this comes to it out of passion. But also, there is a certain amount of discipline you have to have about to make a project like this, especially one that's large. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people fall off when passion kind of exits the situation and it becomes work. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And that's where the perseverance that Miguel's talking about actually does become very important. Uh, but um, the huge, one of the huge things that kept us motivated, I guess, was the fact that like, Today, um, you can do a thing, you know, like like work on a game by yourself, take it to Kickstarter, and publish it yourself with no intermediary. And so there is no gatekeeping; it doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you you're able to actually take a project to completion if you want to do that. It's it's not easy to do, but the the venue being open for you is like a is like a, it's always been a huge motivating factor for me personally. Um, mm. That I can take ideas that I have and turn them into something that can become finished and complete and people will participate in and read and stuff is like a massive motivating factor for me. Mm. Um, And it largely because of the internet. I don't think you would have this kind of, um, you know, flourishing of the indie RPG scene that you see today uh, if like a site like itch.io didn't exist, Mm -hmm. for example. Yeah, I think that to to echo what Tom said, it's one of the the things I came around to too, is there's, there's a certain amount of discipline that you need. And I think that that, um, you know, to, to, to work through um, when it's difficult or the discipline to come back uh, to something after you've set it aside for a little while. Oh, it's hard. Um, yeah. And, and I, you know, I don't, yeah, I don't it's know. It's a learned I'm... skill. Like it's a life, it's a life skill, like same as like time management or oh, anything yeah. like that. It's a thing that you have to practice. Mm-hmm. It's, it's very difficult. You... Yeah. Yeah, I think if you, if you if you really do it, and 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 if you're you know, um, the the best advice that I hated to hear, um, <laughs> that I that I've heard from every one who's finished a project is the only way to do a thing is just to do it, mm-hmm. and it's you know like it's it's hard to hear that as someone who I write I, I tend to write more passion focused, um, and discipline is hard for me. Uh, the discipline to return to a thing over and over and over uh, and push through when it's difficult. I'm, I'm actually, I'm experiencing that now. Uh, I was just talking about that today um, uh, with a friend of mine about um, uh, current stuff for Lancer, uh, current narrative stuff. But um, dang it, the only way to do something is to do it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. Yep. And uh, people really like, have to have a community to, to find a community and, and to, oh, yeah. to have other other folks, yeah. whether it's, it's on the creative side or on the... Um, um, on the reader side, that's one of the best things that you can do. Yeah. Um, and if you can't find that community, uh, to do what you can to try and create it, I think is also very helpful. Pe- pe- people often ask me, like, how, how do you how do you get how do you get into comics? Like, how do you get to practice comics and like publish comics professionally? And how do you get to the point that you're at? I'm like, well, I'm about um, 480 <clears throat> pages in on my comic right now. Yeah, I was gonna, <laughs> so I was that's gonna say how you, that's how you for maybe a. <laughs> maybe a decade before anyone yeah, picked up one. That's how that's so how you get good at it. it. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty much it. So it's tough. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. But that's Our... also a good thing. Is that sorry? Sorry the, the, no, the, to end on the optimistic note. That's <laughs> a, I think the, the, that's the, that's the good thing, right? Is that it's not hard. I mean, the the advice that you need to hear, the the the, the tools that you need, it's not it's not mm. particularly difficult. There's no like course that you need to buy. There's no book that's going to teach you how to be a good writer. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, read, obviously read because reading makes you a better, a better writer, I think. Um, uh, but, but there's no secret that, that, that is, that there, there's no secret to unlock. It's just, yeah. just do it. <laughs> the legendary well, the barrier to entry is yeah. lower than it has ever been. I think. Yeah. The, yeah. The, I mean, the, I was, yeah. The legendary Bob Ross said, that talent is applied experience, which is true. So, you know, just, uh, just keep at it, whatever you're doing. Mm-hmm. You'll get there eventually. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Asians Represent. Asians Represent celebrates Asian creators and diversity in the gaming community. Join hosts Agatha Chain and Daniel Kwan as they discuss gaming, genre, and representation with their guests and occasionally argue with each other to the sound of Agatha's beloved air horn app.